Hey team, you're about to experience my interview with Louis Cabanye from Okoro. He is the co-founder of Okoro and Okoro is a B2B e-commerce payments platform. It allows B2B merchants to supply trade credit as well as buy now, pay later payment services to their customers through their digital channels. We had a great conversation about the evolution of B2B e-commerce over the last few years, as well as how B2B e-commerce customers now expect multiple payment methods to be offered to them just like they get in the B2C and D2C world. We had a great conversation about all things payments, B2B, and so much more. Enjoy. Welcome to B2B Commerce Corner. Commerce Corner is a sub-series of the e-commerce edge podcast discussing all things B2B commerce through the lens of agencies, consultants, merchants, and more. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Pod. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Louis Carbonier from Hokoro to the podcast. Welcome, Louis. Hey, Jason. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, look, I had to return the favor. You featured me as a panelist on your webinar today where we were talking all about the brand new release of your definitive guide to B2B e-commerce buyer demands in 2024. I know that's a mouthful, but yeah. I love original research done in the B2B commerce space. And there's just there's not enough of it, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I realized presenting this afternoon that it was quite a mouthful, especially from for a French guy trying to pronounce the the name of the report <laughs> in full. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. But I think I think what, what what was really brought to the fore as we were on that webinar today and we we're presenting some of the key findings. Obviously, it's a long report, but we we were only able to dig into a few different really key pieces of research. But I think from my perspective. What it showed is some of the it reinforced some of the gut feel thinking we have from the industry and working in the industry, but it teased out some insights that I think you wouldn't have automatically th thought to be true yeah. uh, until you actually got the responses. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's so true. And I think doing this with you and with the guys at Oro Commerce and the B two B Commerce Association in the UK that was awesome. And I think. We all were pretty surprised by some of the key takeaways. There was one, and to be clear, like for the viewers or listeners to the podcast, we surveyed literally hundreds of B2B buyers all over the world. And so we went grassroots into that research, got the bottom up insights. And it was flabbergasting to hear that 98% of B2B buyers are experiencing issues at the checkout. And that's, I think, the overall theme that I perceived was that there's a massive disconnect between B2B buyers' expectations and what the industry, what B2B mer merchants are currently bringing to the market. And one of the, other, one of the other takeaways that, again, wasn't one of the headline talking points, but this one le leapt out at me, 69% of B2B buyers find researching suppliers online on their own more effective than interacting with the sales rep during the discovery process and that what that tells me is that this whole idea of a gated b2b e-commerce website yeah. if, if, even if you offer one if it's gated the reality is that you're not that even going to be in the consideration set uh yeah. for most of these modern b2b buyers because they yeah. are starting their supplier selection journey with a google search in many instances and if you're not there uh, for widget x and they're looking for widget x and they don't know that you manufacture widget x or distribute widget x you're simply not going to get that call. You're not going to have an opportunity for your sales rep or your AE or your SDR to talk to these B2B buyers because they won't even know you exist. Yeah, it, exactly. It kills the awareness. It kills the consideration. The top of your funnel basically shrinks. And there was this other finding, which was that 93% of B2B buyers are online at some point of their purchasing journey. So it's not B2B trade, making sure like the point you made about all those gated websites or I think they're counterproductive, as you said. Not only are B2B buyers starting their supplier search online, but they have an absolute default expectation now as more millennial buyers 
replace these legacy B2B buyers that always were reliant on the personal relationship to drive these the growth of these B2B brands. Now, because we have a lot more millennial buyers taking over the, the buy side of the B2B equation, they, they're digital natives. They expect to be able to do everything online, don't they? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And there was somewhere in, a report, in the report, yeah, this stat that more than two thirds of B2B buyers, so people doing procurement today, are millennials or younger. And you know, these are people who grew up with a mobile phone in their hands, who've been you know, purchasing as individuals on all those platforms, and they have certain expectations about what a consumer grade purchasing journey looks like and when they're procuring when they're buying on behalf of their organization they just they just have the same ingrained reflexes as when they're buying for themselves so that's just something that we should take for granted and you know, stop gating the our catalogs or that doesn't mean disclosing pricing grids and so on it's still b2b and there's an amount of customization that needs to happen but why kill your online presence, your SEO impact, and so on, by gating too much? Yeah, and it's such an interesting thing, too. So enterprise SEO, meaning platforms that help e-commerce brands create SEO-ready pages at scale, mm. these have been a common – this is a common use case in the B2C and D2C world for many years. And these platforms are very expensive, but they help these brands – expand their organic reach by creating hundreds of thousands uh, or you know tens of thousands depending on the size of the catalog uh, seo perfect pages and, and categories that match those query strings uh, that are happening in google search yeah. matching them perfectly and landing them on page with exactly the subset of products that exactly match that buying intent and b2b has missed out historically on the opportunity to build those types of pages at scale because they simply have never made their catalog visible to Google in the first place. Yeah, and I guess this speaks to the problem of the, the data being buried oftentimes in an, in an ERP and not being easily surfaceable, not having good product descriptions. And one of the interesting trends that we observe on our side of the Atlantic, but I'm, I know as well in North America, is the rise of B2B marketplaces. And those marketplaces have a, are doing a fantastic job in terms of creating transparency and visibility on the catalog of product. I think, I, I think you're right. And I think the great thing about this push into a self-service e-commerce experience is it forces these B2B brands to get their uh, data house in order. It, mm -hmm. it forces them to look at their product data. It forces them to look at their customer data. It forces them to look at their price list. It forces them to look at images, videos, PDFs, all of the, the rich product data that typically is lived maybe in a salesperson's head or in a print catalog mm -hmm. or in a PDF on a network drive that then the salesperson attaches to an email and sends to their customer. It centralizes all this information and it takes this institutional knowledge and it turns it into digital equivalents. And then the beauty of that is not only can they use that data on their own e-commerce website, but if they have, if, let's say they're a manufacturer and they're, they're working with distributors as their customers, they can get that data into their distributor's hands. They can get that uh, data into their wholesaler's hands. They can get that data into their retail partner's hands. They can get that data into marketplaces like Amazon and the other B2B specific uh, marketplaces, which are growing at a massive clip. DC360 predicts, I think, by the end of 2024, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think they say that by the end of 2024, there'll be over 1,000 global B2B specific and vertical niche marketplaces. And the reality is, you can't become channel agnostic until you have digital versions of all your product data. It's that simple. I, I t absolutely. I t totally agree. And it's funny because I didn't read that article, but with, the, with our team, at some point, like three or four years ago, we did a survey of how many B2B marketplaces we could find in Europe, and maybe we had 80 or 90 of them. We refreshed that data last year. I think just for Europe, we were at... 250 B2B marketplaces that were of significant size, because of course you have new marketplaces popping up every day. 
And among the different modules that you mentioned that are all being digitized and bring the B2B experience to a next level, there's also the whole payments theme, which is where we as a company, Hokoda, we, we specialize and where traditionally B2B payments have been something very manual, a bit in the back office with the credit managers, people running collections, and all this thing is actually being digitized. And one of my, I had to do a bit of a crystal ball predictions. I'd say that we have a e-commerce now is a, a new opportunity, a nascent opportunity for many B2B uh, merchants, but it's forcing a digitization of processes, as you described, including in payments and merchants, merchants are having to move to more instant digital systems that are actually proving to be better than the old ones because they generate a common source of truth, reliable data on which you can run some analysis. And as a result, my you know, favorite prediction of the year is that gradually this new business line, this e-commerce channel is actually going to take over the old processes and it's going to be a bit like a reverse takeover where what was the new kid on the block is actually helping b2b companies replatform and migrate all their systems to something that's yeah more instant more reliable single source of truth and supports also the the, the api economy because this is what we're talking about in uh, in this case one of my uh, predictions uh, for B2B companies is that we're actually with the e-commerce piece, we're creating a new infrastructure, which is more real-time, more digitized, streamlines the processes and everything, which is actually going to reverse take over the rest of the companies uh, because the, it's becoming effectively a better, simpler version of the old process. And what we're seeing modestly in our little payments world is that sometimes we do the payments for the e-commerce bit of a, of a merchant, which entails the whole trade credit process, and we help them manage this online. And after a few months, then the, the merchant tells us, oh my God, this is so much more efficient than Joe running it off a spreadsheet in the finance back office. Let's take the offline bit and move it onto your system. But I suspect that the same is true with the, the rest of the value chain that you described before, where eventually I think e-commerce is going to make a massive contribution to the economy. Yeah, we see it at each of our clients, pretty much every client, that the fastest growing distribution channel is invariably e-commerce. And you know, many people will say, yeah, but it's only 10% of our sales. And I think in B2B, uh, depending on the sector you look at, in general, it's true that e-commerce is often going to be between like 10%, 20%. So it's not, so it's still relatively small. But what the survey was showing is that B2B buyers are actually using online at some point of the journey anyway, it's 93%. And this is like, a general massive expectation and there was another stat which was that 98 percent of b2b buyers are facing challenges somewhere in the checkout of their b2b journey that one honestly i didn't expect this is showing so much of a gap and but that also says how much potential there is to do better and to gain market share and to also migrate some of those smaller customers that maybe we were serving manually and just create efficiencies for everyone, for the client, for ourselves as an organization. So there's, let's look at the glass half full and uh, how much potential there is there. And in the workflow that you've described, which I think is pretty common in B2B, uh, in fact, all the consideration was done online. And most of the decision was actually done online. And because the, the supplier ended up mailing the, the invoice to, to the buyer and the buyer settled that through their usual AP process, okay, strict sensu, the transaction was done offline, but the bulk of it ha actually took place online. And that's a, an illustration of software eating the world. 
And once you start having to display this product info, this pricing info to a customer, then it has to be 100% reliable. And therefore, you're creating an, and it has to be instant because a customer cannot sit on there in front of their browser and waiting for five seconds for the little wheel to spin and give the, and display on screen. Then you're actually recreating something which is going to be much more usable because it's also going to be in a UX, UI that is customer friendly or at least usable. You're actually going to create something that's going to be useful to your internal teams and becomes the new system of record. And yeah, may, maybe, and we've seen that with one of our clients where it used to be the ERP that was the system of record. And the problem that was the ERP wasn't really usable because the queries would take too long and you couldn't have a customer wait for it. I think that was a six seconds latency which is totally fine for an internal user. You can make your employees wait for six seconds. They don't like it, but they can do it if you tell them to. But your customer is not going to wait for another six seconds. So what that merchant ended up doing was take the ERP data, dump it into a new data lake that could be queried much faster, sub-second, and that would then feed the uh, data displayed online. But guess what? That's also what the employees ended up using for their own searches for, to create their statistics, data viz, whatever. And gradually the ERP was a very low layer in the tech stack of that merchant. And there's something that I really like about B2B, which is that compared with B2C, I think the real leverage is around the frequency of purchase. For us, as we focus on the checkout and on the payments part, we tweaked a little bit our uh, our positioning and our pitch based on the data that we saw. Like initially, we were like, with your better payment methods and better payment plans, you'll get higher conversions, you'll get higher basket sizes. And this is all true. It, it happens. But the one that we had underestimated was you'll get higher purchase frequency. And with a B2B buyer... You have the, when someone's identified you as a preferred supplier, the share of wallet that you capture from that, from that buyer is much, much higher. And suddenly they can move from doing what the odd purchase every month at, at your shop to actually what this company is a trusted supplier. They're giving me great payment terms. The experience works. I don't have to rekeep my data, my you know, delivery data, whatever. And then suddenly you see that they do 20, 20, 20 transactions a month. They're on a trade account. They settle once through a consolidated invoice or a statement of account at the end of the following month. And that's all streamlined and it becomes really so much. It, it creates trust in the relationship and the, the upside that you can get on repeatability is so much bigger. Of course, you'll get the plus 30% upside on conversions, but maybe uh, some increase in AOV. But for instance, what we found like is imagine some the buyer is a professional in the construction sector. If they need three bags of cement to build a house, they, they won't be buying 10 just because you give them payment terms or a better payment method. They need three bags of cement to finish that job and that's what they're gonna buy. But what you really want them to do is that the next time they have a job and they need to buy a cement or whatever from, from you, they go to your website and they procure from you. So definitely the upside for me is more around the frequency of the transactions and the loyalty that you can drive from your customers if you're able to provide a better online purchasing experience. And I think to your point earlier around maybe making the business case for investing in digital channels, mm -hmm. I think it's also worth noting that because B2B brands can usually identify a fairly substantial efficiency gain by leveraging digital channels and freeing up their salespeople from instead of doing admin or removing the admin from customer service and saying, look, we're going to offload a lot of this functionality to our e-commerce channel. I think because of that, what B2B brands probably need to look at doing if they want to really get ROI out of the – they need to share 
the efficiency gain and the benefits of that with the customer. So whether that is, hey, if you buy online, this is your price list. If you buy offline, this is your price list. Or we say, okay, we're going to give you an additional 1%, 2%, 3% off every purchase that you execute through our website. It's going to be an automatic 2%, 3% discount on every transaction. And for that matter, I believe that most B2B brands should be incentivizing their sales team to move the transactions, at least for replenishment ordering, into the digital channel. And they probably need to incentivize their sales reps by saying, sure, you're going to get credit for every sale regardless of what channel it comes through. However, when an order comes through a digital channel, whether that be EDI, punch out, self-service e-commerce, we're going to give you an extra 1%, 1.5% in commission so that we're encouraging you to help onboard our customers into those digital channels which are much more, not only more efficient for us and not only a better experience for the customer, but the data we are able yeah. to gather around site search queries, new product development, cross-sales, upsells, all the other, zero, a, a whole lot more zero-party data, a whole lot more behavioral data uh, so that we can craft that experience to get better over time. The benefits to that are a gold mine for B2B brands. And so I think they need to be incentivizing adoption of these digital channels, and then it won't stop at 2%, 5%, 10%, it'll get to a place, you know, 12 to 24 months where it's 50% of all revenue comes through digital channels. Yeah, t totally. And it's interesting that you say that because I haven't seen, I can't think of any client who has, who would have done that yet. I don't know if you've uh, observed that in- I have, okay. and, and it works sense. so incredibly well because at the end of yeah. the day, the benefits are so, that there's as many intangible benefits for the brand as there are tangible benefits. And so in order yeah. to leverage all those benefits and really start to make the – because it's not it's never one and done. That's the whole point. And a lot of B2B brands, they have this mistaken idea. Okay, we go and we spend 100 grand or whatever it is or 150 grand on our e-commerce implementation and we call it good and then we never revisit it again for five years. This is a process of ongoing yeah. digital transformation in the business, and in order to make the business case for recurring investment, we have to see data as an asset instead of a cost center in the business. And if you look at it that way, then it becomes pretty easy to make the business case for ongoing investment in digital channels. Yeah, totally agree. I think that's the long-term price, the better data that you get on your customers and what it unlocks then in terms of your insights about their purchasing behaviors, their payment behaviors. You have some clients that you, you thought were giving you that much marginal gain, where in fact, it turns out that they generate much more returns than the others. Actually, I was reading something fascinating where a, a merchant was using a kind of Klarna and then realized that those customers we're actually generating way more return than the other ones. So once you have that data, you look at the lifetime value of a customer of sub-segments, cells, data cells, and, and you, your segmentation suddenly becomes so much more granular. And you're like, okay, those people, they're not long-term adopter, adopters. They just want to try and return. And Whereas the, these ones, when you take into account all the cost of servicing them, the amount of queries they make and so on, that's actually costing us that much more. And then the value of this data is massive. But then I think this is the long-term prize. And oftentimes we see merchants being probably rightly so more pragmatic and a bit more short-term focus and doing a kind of basic calculation of this is how much an account exec costs me right now. If I could migrate the long tail of my buyers online, this is how much I would serve. I would save by serving them online. But yeah, I think you're right that the long-term price is the, the data you unlock and how you, suddenly your entire organization becomes data-driven, not only the online one, but also the, the rest. Hey team, I have a big favor to ask you. Please pause this episode and send the link of this episode to someone you know that you think would enjoy this content. Really appreciate you spreading the word. This is how we grow. We're not a Joe Rogan. We don't have big, massive advertising budgets, but we absolutely want to grow. We want to get the learnings from all of these episodes out to as wide of an audience as possible, and we need your help to do it. 
Thank you. And now back to your listening. And, and I think you make another really good point, which is that within the B2B realm now, especially from a technical perspective, we can action that data in new and unique ways. So for example, if I knew that, uh, let's say I'm a B2B brand and I'm offering BNPL of some variety, but I know that I have a certain subset of customers that when they use that payment method, for whatever reason, they're doing something. It may not be returns, it may be something else. They're, do, they're taking some action that I don't want them to take uh, as a result of using that payment mm -hmm. method because sometimes there's unpredictable outcomes, right? There's yeah. unintended consequences of making certain offerings to customers. The beauty is we can now make those experiences customized to the customer. So we can say, okay, yeah. what I'm going to do yeah. is I'm actually going to turn off that payment method just for those customers. I'm still going to make yeah. it available for everybody else. And then we're going to, and then we're going to revisit this data every six yeah. months or so. And we're going to, and then eventually we may remove this payment method altogether. If we see that, if we continue pushing people towards that payment method, they all exhibit this similar behavior. We can simply remove it for specific customers or specific accounts or, or and this is true even of credit accounts. So we might say, look, these this particular cohort of customers is are consistently late payers. They consistently pay 30, 60, 90 days late. Cool. We're going to turn off their credit account, but we're going to have three or four other payment methods that are available to them at checkout. Maybe it's BNPL, maybe it's business credit card, maybe it's ACH. So we're gonna we're gonna still allow them to do business with us, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna disincentivize or remove the opportunity for them to take actions which are detrimental to our business. We're not gonna shut off doing business with them altogether. We're just going to craft their experience to send them down the path that is the best for us and the best for them. And I think this is the beauty of being able to have highly tailored and highly personalized digital experiences at scale. Uh, absolutely. And we see this like the most advanced merchants starting to make some of those, of those trade-offs. And to me, it's fascinating because it's like the world of sales and the world of finance coming together. And we see that, for instance, let's say you have a, a cohort of, of clients who are happily paying you upfront or happily paying you in 30 days, and you're already maxing your share of wallet with these guys, why would you offer them 60-day payment terms? You're already capturing your fair share of business from them. You won't get more. The only thing that's going to happen is that you're going to hammer your DSO or you know, incur more costs. And it's about having that granularity that allows you to spot this is a pocket of high potential customers that I could activate. Maybe they have some abandoned cart or whatever, and I could call them back and tell them, look, if we close this business by the end of March, I'm able to give you 60 day payment terms. And suddenly you hit your targets by reigniting the relationship and that boosts your sales. That's massive. But for the other group that we were talking about before, just stay, keep it as it is. And having that granularity allows you to you know, really see what is the return that you get on each of your customer groups. And the other thing I'm, I'm seeing, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is that I'm seeing B2B brands increasingly use e-commerce as an acquisition channel, mm -hmm. not just a sales channel, meaning that historically, it's not only has the experience been gated, but you could never create an account through the e-commerce yeah. e website. You had to create a trade account first through a sales mm -hmm. rep. They yeah. would get your de details and your credit limit and everything into the ERP. The ERP mm -hmm. would sync that account to the e-commerce experience. Then maybe two, three days later, you could log in. You could see your price list. You could see your MOQs. You could see all of everything. You see all your quotes, everything. And I'm seeing a slightly different approach being taken by the most progressive B2B brands, which is, okay, we're going to let you create an account through the front end of our website, but we're going to put you on the highest, uh, highest tier price list that we have available. It's a standard trade price list, the standard B2B discount. We're going to show you the most restrictive catalog we have available, the most restricted subset of the catalog we have available. But what it's, what's that? And we're only going to let you pay by a business credit card. Say, for example, for those, for when you create an account through the front end, you get no credit, you get nothing. You've got to pay via a business credit card, yeah. and then you can purchase straight away. But what that does is that creates a pipeline of hot leads, leads. that automatically yeah. goes directly to the sales team, which says, hey, these customers have already bought through us. Mm -hmm. They don't have a formal trade account. They don't have credit. We don't have, we, we're not customizing a price list for them. We're not customizing a catalog for them. 
go and talk to them. And then that's a hot lead. And, a, and, and we can then say, hey, thanks very much for purchasing through our website. Did you know we have preferential trade accounts available? Did you know we have preferential yeah. catalogs available? We can source things for you that maybe we do, you don't see on the website. Uh -huh. You can open this dialogue to create that much deeper relationship whilst also removing or lowering the barrier to entry to getting that customer into the business in the first place. Yeah, completely. And this is allowing and supporting that first good experience is vital. I think we're, the data landscape is slightly different in Europe. So we're even taking it one step uh, further, where even on the first purchase, so you would cre obviously register, you create your account, but right from the first purchase, you could open a trade account. Obviously, not with a, a, a huge limit, cre cre credit <laughs> limit, but that would allow you to pay by invoice or bank transfer right from the first purchase so that you enjoy a proper B2B environment already upfront. And when you think of it, it, it makes sense because the, the default rate for, for businesses in general is about 1% per annum which means that 99% of the customers that you, you get through your website are probably good customers. And if you're able to pull the data to run a first level of credit analysis in real time, which is something that Hokodo supports, then you're ac actually able to convert m more of these leads and be like, you know, your Tesco, your Vodafone, your Microsoft, or you're a mid-sized business. Of course, I can give you a 5,000 pound euro, dollar, whatever, credit limit for you to complete your purchase. And once you and for those that are, imagine you have a sole trader or some, a mom and pop shop, something a bit smaller, maybe for them, it's going to be a, an installment plan, maybe pay up front 20% and you pay, you settle 80% later on. And what we've seen is that this is obviously fantastic for their liquidity having that first 20% installment massively uh, de-risks in terms of fraud, risk of impersonation. Fraudsters don't like to pay the first 20% installment. <laughs> risks in terms of some people have a bad intent or don't know that they, ultimately they will charge it back or whatever. And you weed out those cases and you even have like new layers of workflows that are coming in with open banking where you you actually sync your bank account data and those things when are once a business is genuinely making a purchase and they're not trying to defraud you those are very strong predictor that this person is interested in in your goods they want to make a trade and in that case why not give them 30 days even though it's the first time yeah Completely agree. And I think that brings together the benefit and that kind of brings us a, a nice segue into what Okoto does. And in the B2B world, unlike the, the D2C and B2, B2C world where everything is, pre, is prepaid in the, in the B2C world, almost everything, not always, but I'd say 90% of transactions yeah. are postpaid in the B2B world and of some variety, whether that be a wire transfer, an ACH, it's... some form of post direct debit, whatever it might be, they're almost all post paid purchases. And this is where Hokoto brings a basically unified payments infrastructure for all the typical B2B payment methods and types to make it seamless for the brand to be able to extend those into the checkout experience for their customers. Yeah, that's exactly right. You said it better than I would with my broken English. And essentially the merchant enjoys a superior payment method that allows them to grow faster because they will have those uh, higher conversions, will put people in a trade account, they will have more repeat, as we discussed before. And the buyer basically pay on their terms. They pay when they, as they always did in, in B2B, so you know, in 30 days, 60 days, whatever. And something that we added only, only a couple of years ago is that the buyer chooses when they, when they pay. But the merchant can choose the merchant can choose when they want to get paid for some merchants who have a very strong balance sheet have always offered thirty sixty day payment terms, just they struggle to do it online. Balance sheet and their working capital cycle supports payment terms that's how it works in their industry. They're happy to wait for thirty days sixty days as they used to, 
But some merchants are like, I want to win more business, but I don't want the liquidity strain. I actually want to, this liquidity to support my growth or whatever. So Hokodo, it's great that my customer is going to pay me in 30 days, but I would like you to pay me upfront. So the buyer can pay later, but I choose when I want to get paid. And if I need the liquidity, I'll pay a little bit more to get the advance payment. And effectively, then Hokoto also, in addition to being a payment gateway and offering multiple payment methods or multiple settlement methods, you also provide effectively bridging finance to some of these organizations yeah. in the form of immediate payment. So you're effectively buying the invoice, as it were, off of the vendor, and you're saying, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna collect in 30, 60, 90 days, but we're going to pay you immediately. We're going to provide you immediate liquidity. We're going to maybe pay you out 100% or 80% or 70% of those invoices or whatever it might be, and we're going to effectively charge you interest on that advance. It's almost like a cash advance. We're going to give you a cash advance based on the outstanding balance of the AP that's owed to you. And we're going to provide you that line of credit as a form of liquidity backed by the outstanding invoices with your clients. Exactly that. And it's been a journey for us to get there because in, initially what, and maybe that's a bit influenced by the B2C world. Initially, we tend to think of the payment and the transaction, which is in fact the tip of the iceberg in B2B. And it's the consequence of a chain of events that starts with a purchase order, with opening an account, building a commercial relationship. Then you have doing a, a credit analysis, making a credit decision. Then you also have fraud detection. We didn't cover it, but in e-commerce, it's huge. Like You want to make sure that the person coming onto your website is who they say they are. So if you have Microsoft coming onto your website, you know, it's easy to give credit to Microsoft, but you, you want to know that you're shipping the goods to Microsoft and not to someone pretending to be Microsoft. So this is also a big piece in the, in the, in the, the workflow. Then you have another one, which we didn't touch upon, but which is also something that gets digitized. It's the collections piece. And that comes with, even with the best credit analysis, even with the best uh, credit checks, you do have some transactions that are paid late. And that's traditionally a bit of a cottage industry at most merchants that can be digitized. There's and doing it in a way that supports the commercial relationship as well, because you don't want to do what you don't want to go in with a baseball bat. If the accountant was late, was on holiday by a couple of, for a couple of weeks. So you need to have some, some rules to predict which merchant tends to pay late for what reason and so on. Then there's another building block, which is the financing bit that you alluded to. So how do you bridge the liquidity strain, bring predictability to the DSO that you have as a merchant. And when you're able to tell the treasurer, look, we're going to bring back your DSO to 35 days and we'll bring it back to what do you want it to be? 15 days. That's going to be cash flows locked in, predictable. That's a fantastic, fantastic change. And then the last one is something that's, that we all call credit insurance, which is even if despite the best credit checks and despite the best collections efforts, there is a, a bad debt, an invoice remains unpaid then you as the merchant remain, you remain protected against the risk of non-payment. And we, Hokodo, will take that on. And it's all those things in B2B that are currently a bit like spread all over the... Fragmented. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Fragmented across sales, finance, and uh, ops, where you have so underneath payment, the credit checks, the fraud detection, the, the insurance against the non-payment, the financing, the collections, all this bit that can actually be digitized. And e-commerce is creating a need for instant decisions, real-time answers to the client's proper data that's forcing us to reinvent all the finance bits surrounding the B2B transaction that, that's why I'm really passionate about this because ultimately I can tell, I can feel yeah. it and I love it. I'm yeah. with you. I'm with you. And you know, um, the e-commerce is like propelling us forward in the, also in the, in areas where we had no idea finance is reinventing themselves and is becoming the engine that supports the sales 
and no longer a back office function as it oftentimes was. And for you guys, what is on your radar? If we were to look out 12, 18 months from now, yeah. what are some of the functions or services or enhancements that you would yeah. like to bring to Hokoto that either your customers are asking for, or you already know, hey, we think if we bring this to the platform, it's going to massively yeah. benefit our customers. What are some of your priorities on your list? Yeah, so I'd say there's a depth of, of functionality where right now, we started with a, an e-commerce payment solution, and then mer merchants were telling us, this is working, we'd like to extend it to our telesales. So we developed a telesales solution. And the example you described a bit earlier, is like now, in fact, merchants really want to be omni-channel and have a seamless, consistent experience across all the distribution channels. So bringing our solution in-store is the next frontier that comes with another level of challenges around fraud and fraud detections. And point so, of sale integration and, and, and terminal and, integration and everything else, right? Yeah, not, but these ones, I think we can solve. The fraud ones are probably the hardest for us in, in, in pay. But then there's another one, which is developing a, we do deferred payments because that's what 90% of B2B buyers want and what B2B merchants do. However, Despite the, your, the very best efforts, you always have 10% of your clients that are not eligible to trade accounts. They're not eligible to deferred payment just because they're too risky. And, for, and these people need to pay upfront. And our merchants are telling us, guys, we like Hokkaido. That's the best payment method. But what about the 10% that are not eligible to payment terms? What, what do we do with them? And up to now, we didn't have a solution for that. We're, we've crafted a pay now solution, which is in is, its early days, but has been rolled out to some merchants now. We got full payments license across all the European countries. And being able to bring that seamless payments experience across pay now and pay later, and that, that can help in many ways, because you also have people who hit their credit limit, but you do in that case, pay some of it upfront, and then you enjoy the rest of your credit limit for your other purchases. So this is a massive unlock in terms of how we can support merchants with a comprehensive payments offering that cover all their needs for e-commerce offline and in the future in store. And at that point, it will be omni-channel. So that's the vertical functionality gain. Then the other thing is, I would say, horizontal duplicating what we do in more countries. We're present in, we cover 80% of the European Union. But if, let's say, we have a, an English customer who's exporting to Sweden and they tell us, hey, we have 10 clients in Sweden, Can you, could you cover them? Right now, unfortunately, we, we let our clients down. So making sure that we can cover all of the EU and then start expanding from that. That's the, the next frontier. So we have a big project for us this year where we want to end 2024 covering all of the EU and being the best B2B payments provider in the, in the EU. Wow, what an exciting journey that you've already been on. And man, by, by, if you can nail all this by the end of 2024, you'll be doing well because there's a lot of, there's a lot of plumbing that has to be developed to be able to, and, and a lot of red tape and government approvals and banking connections yeah. and everything else that Licensing, has to be created. So, yeah, yeah. compliance it, all over the place. <laughs> yeah, KYC and just AML and all those things. When you effectively almost become a bank, you're now in a scenario where you're heavily regulated. And so, look, I, I wish you well on all this. Look, Louis, this has been a fantastic conversation. You're a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of information around B2B. I really appreciate it. If people want to learn more, what's the? how are people best to get a hold of you? I'll drop your LinkedIn link in the show notes yeah. and the Hokoto website link in the show notes. But if people want to find out more, particularly if they're operating a B2B business in Europe and they want to bring seamless payment technology into their stack, how do they find out more? 
our website is a fantastic starting point. If they can reach out to me on LinkedIn, email is very easy. It's louis at hokodo.co. Make sure you don't do .com, it's .co. And okay. Yeah, then we can pick it up from there. It's super easy. It's, it's all API, simple integration. We're in the 21st century. B2B is catching up. Finally. Oh, I absolutely love it. Now, Louis, we're coming down to the end of our time together, and this is the point where I get to flip the script and hand the microphone over to you and let you ask me one question. Any question you like can be personal or professional. So, Louis from Hokoto, what is your question for me today? Yeah. So, Jason, if you had one thing that you do all over, that if you were to start your career all over again, what would you do differently in the world of B2B? I just would have doubled down on B2B sooner. I mm. spent many years, the first three quarters of my career was focused on D2C and, and B2C. And I, I started getting a taste of B2B when I was working laterally in the agency world. And we had some B2B projects come through the door and I really loved them. And I, we talked about this off air because in the B2C and D2C world, you're usually working with marketing teams, you're usually working with creatives, you're working with designers, you're working with uh, user experience people, you're, you're working with people that are really concerned about brand presentation, they're concerned really with the granular elements of the customer experience. Where typically in the B2B world, we're dealing with the technical and operational teams within the business. And because I'm so, like, I'm not a creative, I, I'm, I'm not a digital marketer, so I, because I don't necessarily feel as much of a kinship with marketing teams as I do with technical and operational teams, it's easier for me to have those dialogues with technical and operational teams because we speak the same language. And so I, I just, I, don't worry, I love both sides. I love D2C, B2C, and I love B2B, but I guess I wish I would have seen the writing on the wall even sooner around B2B. And look, I, I, I it's not like I'm about to die tomorrow. So I've got many more years to be able to work in this space. But I, I, I found a real passion for B2B because there's so few people in the industry. It's, it's very blue ocean. And in the B2C, D2C world, there's so much competition. There's massive competition amongst agencies, massive comp uh, competition amongst consultancies, massive comp competition amongst platforms and technologies. In the B2B world, it's just not as competitive because we're – now, today, probably where B2C was a decade ago. And so yeah. we got a lot of catching up to do. So there's a lot of, there's a lack of maturity in the B2B e-commerce space still. And there's a massive push and demand for resources in this space for people that have both digital skills and e-commerce skills and B2B skills. And those are like unicorns. And, and so it, it's, it's been fun to jump into the very, very blue ocean space of B2B e-commerce over the last, say, five years. But I, I guess if I had it to do all over again, I, I would have doubled down on B2B even sooner, is, is what I would yeah. say. I, I don't like to live yeah. a life of great regret, but definitely I enjoy it so much. I wish I, could, I wish I could go back and wind the clock back a little bit. That's amazing. And it's funny because for, for me, I, I actually spotted it about 10 years ago and then started really uh, working on it around 2015. But it's back then people were dismissing it as, oh, you know, B2B is too complex. It's never, it's a, the commercial relationship is, is paramount. It's never going to migrate online and you're too early and a good idea too early is not a good idea and so on and so forth. But I think it's, we're actually now at the tipping point where we've seen 93% of B2B buyers are actually online at some point in the journey. So that, that says it all. It certainly does. Louis, this has been a fantastic conversation, and I can't wait to do it with you again soon. Thank you so much. Are you a B2B or D2C e-commerce merchant? Then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to learn how we can help you scale your business.